welcome to La Princesse Sirene. Today I'm going to be talking about theatrical sewing techniques for historical costuming. Now, if you're somebody that wants to research the exact hand sewing stitches done in a certain time period, or exactly the closures they would have used on this particular type of garment, this is not the video for you. Please close this now before you get angry at me. But if you are somebody like me that doesn't always have time to do all of that research and all of the hand sewing and things like that, maybe you'll find something in here helpful. <laughs> okay, so I've worked in theater for many years. I have a degree in theater. That is how I learned to sew. And there's lots of things that we do for theater that I think could be really applicable to historical costuming. Things like making sure that this garment you're making is going to last for as long as possible. Lots of theater productions go on for years, or even decades, depending on the show. You want to make sure that that piece of clothing you've made is going to last over being used that many times, and these are clothes that are going to be danced in and sweated in eight times a week. They need to be pretty sturdy, so sometimes you use slightly sturdier materials than you would if you're making something very delicate that'll only be worn a few times and this is something that I do a lot in my own historical costuming. I try to pick fabrics that I know aren't going to completely fall apart the first time I wear them. And I try to construct things in such a way that it's going to hold up. I make sure that all of my seams are finished. I make sure that my hem is done up properly. And this helps something really last a long time. The other thing that we do a lot for theater is that if a show is going to happen, over a long period of time or be redone every year, like some theaters do Christmas Carol every winter or something, it's not always going to be the same person wearing that dress. So we always make things to be really adjustable. So you'll add extra seam allowance on the inside of every seam that you possibly can anyway, <laughs> um, and you'll use that to either let in or let out that garment as needed to fit different shape and size people and leaving extra space at the hem. It helps keep things really adjustable so that you don't have to make a new dress for every single new actor playing that part. How this can be helpful for your costumes is people fluctuate in weight. I have gained or lost weight over the last several years since I started making my own clothes and I have found that things I made a few years ago don't really fit anymore, but the things that I made with that extra seam allowance, I was able to alter them and still be able to wear them and things that I had put that perfect neat lining in, trimmed all my seam allowances down, I had to sell them because I just wasn't going to fit into them anymore. Um, so this is something I do on almost everything now, especially things I've been working on during quarantine. I don't know <laughs> with all of the pizza and potatoes I've been eating if I'm gonna fit into anything anymore. So there is room to add, I think, two or three extra inches <laughs> into every garment I've made. Highly recommend. Another thing you can do to help your clothes last longer is to keep a scrap bag. I have a bag with a bunch of stuff from different dresses I've made over the last couple of years and I save these so that I can use them to repair something later. If you get a hole and you want to patch it with a matching fabric, you got a little bit, you need to add a piece because, whoops, it's been three years since you made that and you gained a little weight, you can add an extra panel or even if you've got a big enough piece, recut something so that you can help that garment fit again. Like, last year I thought that that strawberry dress I made was never going to fit again because I just couldn't get it to close in the back and then I found in my scrap bag these little pieces of the fabric that I had left over. I was originally going to make a matching bag, I think. I never did it and I was able to use this to let out that dress a little bit more and it's not perfect but I spent 36 hours embroidering that and I was not going to let it go if I could help it. Another thing we do a lot in theater is skip the lining and this sounds totally bonkers but you are the only one who's ever going to see that and if you skip that lining and leave all of your seams open it is so easy to just open up that seam quick, take it in, let it out a little bit. It takes you so much less effort than having to unpick a lining, also alter the lining. Like it, it makes it a lot faster and easier if you're going to need to change the size of this garment fairly often. 
or even at all, like I have clothes that I made with a beautiful lining, I trimmed everything nicely, and I could let it out, but it would take me so much time, I'd rather just make a new garment than have to deal with taking apart and altering the one I already have. So it keeps things in my wardrobe a lot longer because it's so easy to change the size on it and because so many people, especially, like I've had so many weight changes over the last few years that it's really helpful to be able to keep things always fitting to where I currently am with my weight and my body shape. So I find it super helpful. <laughs> So because I'm often not using a lining, I will often flatline my fashion fabric to a slightly thicker fabric than I normally would. So instead of having a thinner fabric flatlined to my fashion fabric and then a lining, I will use something thicker so that I don't have to have the lining for that extra structure and it's still easy to alter things when everything is all made as one individual piece per pattern piece. So I've used a cotton canvas to line the inside of a ball gown bodice because it helps keep the structure with not that many bones and things. It's maybe a little bit thicker than I need, but it works. It serves the function I need. Um, I think flat lining things really helps a lot with keeping things nice and neat. I know I've had problems in the past with thinner fabrics and you put a thin lining fabric in and you can see the color of your corset through the dress and you never want that. Another thing we do a lot in theater is using a lot of unconventional materials for a project. Like, I have made things for a show using fishing line and screen printing fabric, all kinds of weird stuff. Like, don't be afraid to use something interesting if you really like it. Like, if there's a print you really like or a fabric that isn't quite historically accurate but you are just so in love with it, like, just go ahead and use it. You have my permission. <laughs> Like, the last two ball gowns I made were made out of completely synthetic fabrics because that's what fit in my budget, and they had the look that I wanted. They look very much like a taffeta with a sheer overlay, and that is what I was going for, and it was maybe a quarter of the expense of buying silk. So sometimes if your budget says you can't have the very fancy thing, it's okay to get something that looks a lot like the fancy thing, but it is way less expensive. Like, you go ahead and make stuff out of whatever you want to. <laughs> now, if you're sitting there going, but Amanda, if I don't have a lining, how do I finish my edges? Well, I am here to tell you that bias bindings and facings are your new best friend. They take very little time, very little effort. I find them so much quicker and easier than making a full lining because you can just bias bind the whole bottom and top edges of a bodice. You can make a shaped facing if it's just too much curve or weird shape to get the bias around. And I think it's really easy. It's really easy to pop that off. And if it gets a little dirty, like you can freshen up your garment by replacing that. It's easy to take off if you need to make alterations. I highly recommend. <laughs> One of the things I do a lot in the costume shop is serge everything. And I mean everything. We hardly ever touch a French seam or a hand-felled anything. If no one's going to see it, it gets surged. Because surging will stay there forever, your garment will never fray, and you can just zip that right through the machine and you are done. Now, if it's something that's going to be seen, if you're working on a sheer fabric or it's something that someone's going to see the inside of it, probably not for that. But Every skirt seam I ever do, surged. Insides of bodices, surged. Like, your serger is your friend. I highly recommend getting one if it's within your budget. I know there are ones you can buy at Joann's that aren't terribly expensive. I find it so helpful and it saves me so much time and I don't have to worry about what's going to happen to the inside seams on a garment because I know that they're finished off and nothing's gonna happen to them. Okay, so now this is probably where I'm going to lose a couple of people. I put zippers in almost everything. Now, get mad at me if you want, that's fine. But, I love zippers. Put an invisible zipper up the back of a skirt, 
You never have to worry about that opening coming open. You don't have to worry about sewing tons of little snaps or hooks. And if it's not somewhere that's going to be really obvious, I hide zippers left and right on everything I make. And it also makes getting dressed so much faster to me. And like, I won't do this in obvious places. Like if a bodice has a buttoned up front, I'll make the buttonholes. I'm not gonna put a zipper straight up the front of everything, but almost every skirt I make, especially if it's in a spot that gets covered up by a jacket or something else, I just put a zipper up it because it's just easier. <laughs> also, a side note, every Broadway musical you've ever seen with a big fancy dress, big honkin' zipper up the back. Every single one. Because those ladies often have one minute to change their entire costume. They don't have time for buttons. <laughs> and I know when you're getting ready for an event, you don't have to literally get yourself dressed in 35 seconds before you have to be back on stage. But there is a certain joy to being dressed in only a couple of minutes and being able to get on your way. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna show you examples of what I'm talking about, starting with this dress that I made two years ago for the Renaissance Fair. So as an example for using odd materials, this dress was made out of some vintage curtains from the 80s. And you can still see the weird seam from when it used to be a curtain that I couldn't quite get rid of when making the skirt. This is another example of using odd materials. I bought two cheap costume jewelry necklaces. I think these were each $10. I restrung them and then sewed them down to the dress exactly where I wanted them to sit while I was wearing it so that it couldn't fall off, it couldn't get skewed to one side, and I think it looks great. So here's the back of this dress. I used a lot of modern theatrical techniques on this one. Um, there's snaps holding the skirt opening closed, the waistband is closed with two hooks and bars and a snap, the snap helps keep the bars from sliding out of the hooks and having your skirt fall down. I also used modern grommets just for ease. I was in a bit of a rush trying to get this done. And I also connected the bodice to the skirt with ballet loops, which means I can take the bodice off of the skirt for storage, which makes it easier and it protects my bodice because the skirt is very heavy so I can hang them up separately. Example number two is my new bustle dress that I made a few months ago. It closes with a zipper, a couple of snaps, and the waistband has a hook and a snap at the top. So all I have to do is just zip that up the side, put the snaps to cover up the zipper, one there, and one goes underneath the little tab on the side and it's like there isn't a zipper there at all and everything stays in place and the tab is also tacked in place so it can't fly away. So here you can see the bodice for the bustle dress. The little crossy straps come off, they hook on the sides to keep everything closed and inside you can see what I mean about leaving your seams open. Um, so if you look, you can see I can super easily pop this seam open here and I would have like two extra inches on each side should I ever need it. I've also used some bias to finish off the bottom edge, a facing on the top edge. I've left extra seam allowance at the shoulder. And you can also see I've finished the fronts and the back separately. So I don't have to take that bias off to be able to pop that seam open and make adjustments. I can just open it, restitch it, and put it right back together. And I don't have to worry about moving that bias anywhere. And I can change darts if I really needed to. Like everything is just open and ready to go if I need to make changes. So if you actually made it to the end of this video, congratulations! <laughs> if there's anything in here that you found helpful that you think you want to give a try, if there's something that made you particularly angry, please do let me know. 
If you have any questions about my peculiar ways of doing things, I'm always happy to answer questions or clarify anything, so please get in touch if you want to know more, and have a good day!